تكفري لا تجزعي يا نفس إن لم تغفري لا تجزعي وإلى موائد جود مولاك الرعي يا نفس إن لم تغفري لا تجزعي وإلى موائد جود مولاك الرعي وإذا ت السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. شيخ، well, thank you for joining us. I think this is episode nine. Uh, a bus conversation with our lovely Sheikh Abu Alia. Uh, how have you been, uh, Sheikh? Uh, I'm good. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Just kind of uh, getting on my feet again after Ramadan, mashallah, as many of us are. Uh, uh, and you? The yes, no, alhamdulillah. Just an apology to the uh, uh, people who've tuned in. Sorry, we had some real technical difficulties. So, but alhamdulillah, they were resolved and we managed to get on, but we were a bit late today. So, uh, please uh, excuse us for that. No, alhamdulillah, I think you're quite right. After Ramadan, you just need to sort of get back into the flow of things, subhanAllah. Um, you, you tend to sort of, well, I tend to anyway. I, I find that certain things are, are difficult to do in Ramadan. And uh, so you tend to do more ibadah and what have you, and then you're not sort of doing some of the other things, um, like streams and things like that. But, but mashallah, yeah, um, wonderful Ramadan, alhamdulillah. The uh -huh. weather has now perked up finally, so we've now, now so began to see some sun. Uh, Absolutely, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. So, mashallah. Sheikh, today's subject, um, an important one really, um, which is how should we Muslims respond uh, with the current uh, fitna, the current problems that we are ex experiencing. Um, obviously, the the obvious ones are uh, Myanmar and our brothers, you know, um, the, the Uyghurs, the the Rohingya Muslims, the, um, you know, the, the brothers and sisters in Palestine, in Kashmir, even in India. Uh, we're seeing this, uh, almost this resurgence of, or far right, um, you know, violence against Muslims in particular, and, and obviously other, other minorities as well. I mean, the Sikh community, for example, in India, are have always been persecuted uh, by the majority there as well. Um, but you have this myriad of responses that Muslims tend to um, to, to sort of react. Uh, um, the, the, some become violent. Some, thankfully, a very very small minority, but. Some people on the other extreme um, say that we shouldn't do anything. We shouldn't demonstrate. We shouldn't, you know, we just do dua and sort of that's it. So today's discussion really is, is um, in relation to what the valid or, or, or sensible approach, uh, the Islamic approach, uh, should be when we see these calamities uh, that, that, that are befalling us at the moment. And obviously, uh, Sheikh also the concept or the or the acknowledgement that this is not something new that these things have happened before uh, islam and muslims have seen turmoil um, from enemies of islam uh, you know and and sometimes things have been worse as well throughout history um, so sheikh what would what would you say to that in terms of what our response should be as muslims when we see these things Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Those are really, um, you know, fantastic questions. Uh, in one sense, they're the questions of the moment. You know, those are the, it's the highly topical issue. But they're also very contentious in one sense. Um, um, when we begin to speak about um, some of the uh, political oppression and tyranny, that uh, Muslim groupings and communities around the world face, uh, it can be very emotive. 
uh, it can be very, uh, it can, it, it can, and it should <clears throat> make one uh, angry uh, for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and. There are, I, I, I suppose, um, 101 people offering 101 um, solutions. And sometimes what we can, uh, what tends to happen is that we feel that uh, there can only be one solution, which is the solution that I'm advocating. And I can be very hostile and I can get very uh, ratty with, with you if you, if you differ uh, with me. Even if you take a completely different approach to me, if that approach doesn't have the emotional content uh, that, for example, my approach may have, uh, then I might begin to suspect you of really not caring uh, for the ummah. Um, so it can be, <coughs> it, not, not it can be, it is, is a very emotive, highly charged, uh, sensitive subject, which um, I... I'll mention it from the beginning. I don't have uh, I don't have all the answers. I I don't I don't think I even have many answers. But um, you have you did say something highly relevant um, uh, in your introduction, which is that uh, say something about the fact that you know this ha isn't the first time. It's not as if the ummah <coughs> hasn't faced great um, persecution and tyranny. Uh, and it isn't as if uh, the Ummah hasn't been warned uh, that its enemies will be, you know, kind of sharpening their knives and, you know, grinding, uh, you know, sharpening their teeth to kind of uh, pounce upon uh, the Ummah here or there. Um, so what is the Islamic r response? I can't, if I'm honest uh, with you, Abbas, I don't know if this is the Islamic response. But it is certainly an Islamic response. Some of the things I'd like to say, this is an Islamic response. Uh, it is a response born out of uh, the teachings of the book and the sunnah. Uh, it's uh, teachings born out of uh, trying to uh, be realistic about the world that we live in today. Um, but what it is not going to be born out of is... And I mean this in all, all respect, but I, I, I hope that the conversation would, not necessarily this conversation, but Muslims would have this conversation amongst themselves, that uh, it is not born out of uh, Western philosophical isms, uh, a revolutionary Marxism, Marxism type of outlook, uh, for example, or the, or the woke outlook, which is, you know, more contemporary. Um, not to say that there isn't anything beneficial uh, in, in such outlooks. It's to say that our starting point and our foundations is revelation. Not, uh, you know, you know, revelation doesn't ask us to be woke in the, in the sense that we use the term now or the term is used now. And nor does it ask us to be uh, revolutionary Marxists, for example. But a lot of that um, a lot of that ideology of, uh, of Marxism has colored some of the political writings of 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s Islam, and some of it has spilled over into the 21st century. Uh, and then the recent woke movement and ideas like that have, have and do continue to shape Muslim political uh, engagement and activism. And I'm saying that, well, if we're going to spend that much energy and passion, let's at least get simple foundations right. And these aren't scholarly foundations like I have to do a five day course, I have to study a year. These are just basic foundations that, you know, we just need to have so that if I'm doing something for Allah's, uh, uh, for Allah and for the Ummah of the Prophet, <laughs> let me do it according to the teachings of Allah and the teachings of the Prophet. Otherwise, it seems rather odd that I will. I don't really know specific teachings of Allah and the Messenger in political matters, but I'm somehow going to be working for the sake of Allah. It seems to be a, a contradiction. So here are some uh, some ideas and some things that the that, that both the Quran and the Sunnah say. Well, I think a good place to start is there is a hadith. 
uh, in the Mustadrak of, of Al-Hakim. And it's a famous hadith. I think a lot of people have heard it in one form or the other, which simply says that um, was the fact of whoever wakes up uh, in the morning and he uh, isn't concerned for the for uh, for for the Muslim Ummah, then he is not of us. Okay, whoever awakens in the morning and he doesn't have concern for uh, the the affairs of the Muslims, then he is not of us. Uh, well, the first thing is um, that that particular hadith, which is quite common, is actually not an authentic hadith, and hadiths that have that type of wording are considered by many scholars to be either mildly weak, they range from being mildly weak, da'if, to very weak, da'if jiddan. So we can't say with confidence or with any great amount of certainty that the Prophet wasallam said these actual words. Rather, we're, the certainty is on the side of that maybe he didn't say those words. However, the hadith is weak in its in its authenticity in authenticity, but it is sound in its overall general meaning. Uh, in uh, in in, a, in another famous hadith in 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 Bukhari and Muslim, uh, the the Prophet sallallahu says, "Mathalul mu'minin fi tawadihim wa tarahumihim wa ta'anatufihim mathalul jasadil wahid." The example of the believers in their mutual love, compassion, and mercy is like the example of a single body. If one part of the body uh, aches, then the entire body suffers with sleeplessness and fever, with insomnia and fever. If one part of the body aches, is in pain, then the rest of the body feels that pain and empath empathizes. Therefore, if one part of the ummah is suffering through through tyranny and, and oppression, then the rest of the ummah, us, uh, should be concerned about it and inshallah should feel it at some level. So even though that particular hadith is weak, its overall meaning is correct, which is to say that if I if I don't have if I don't have concern for the affairs of the Muslim, and it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, political affairs, and through political tyranny, it could be economic tyranny, it could be oh uh, the uh, the wife is being abused by her husband down the road, or it could be a homeless Muslim down the road it could be any affair but normally we're talking about in this case today we're going to talk about larger uh, collective political uh, affairs social political affairs and i it doesn't concern me at all because of, well i'm okay so that's what counts then that is indicative of weak iman it is a proof that iman faith is weak the opposite uh, is generally the case that if i am concerned and ready to do something good about it, then inshallah ta'ala, we hope that that is indicative of strong Iman. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to say that um, there is a religious obligation, quite understandably, um, to be concerned about the affairs of the Ummah, but I don't think it I, I don't think it, it can be religiously limited to only political affairs and oppressions, even though in oppression, it's where normally lots of people suffer quite um, heavily. You know, so it's not like going a bit hungry. It's kind of generally worse than that. And there are thousands of people in that worse state. Um, so the point I the, the the point I'd like to make at this point is to simply say, if for example, there my Muslim brethren, my fellow Muslims are calling upon me to just down the road, you know, a few doors away, that oh Abu Ali, can you please help us in this? And I can't, you know, in this situation of ours, and I can't find it in me to spare the time or the money or the effort or even just the the an ear to for them to you know speak to me and i and a shoulder to lean on and i can't spare even that much 
And yet you see me on the, you know, in public on YouTube, oh, the Ummah, Uyghurs, Palestine, Kashmir, or whatever. It is possible that that is hypocrisy. It is possible that that is hypocrisy. It's just a show. Because if I was truly concerned, what stopped me from helping out there? I'm not saying it is. I'm saying it's possible it's hypocrisy. And we all need to kind of... Uh, check ourselves and there's nothing in Islam that says well if it's only two people that shouldn't concern me but if it reaches 2000 then I'm I should be concerned there's nothing like that at all the heart isn't isn't like a, you know it's, we're, we're human beings we're not computers that you know so clinical by numbers and sometimes that and sometimes you do see that sometimes you see you see that and you fear for yourself and you fear for others that subhanallah there's no concern for the plight of the Muslims at arm's reach. But all of a sudden, over yonder in some other part of the world, you're, you, want to get, you want to get uppity about it and you want me to get uppity just, just as you are. And then what happens? That thing is over and I carry on in my own merry way. Um, so we need to check our hearts, but that doesn't change the first rea reality of the first principle. Uh, we are duty bound as an ummah in the mu'minuna ikhwa, the believers are, are nothing but brothers, okay? Um, so the bonds of uh, the ikhwatul imaniyah, the bonds of, uh, of, of faith, the brotherhood of faith, uh, makes us feel uh, the hurt when other Muslims are hurting. Uh, so that's principle number one. And if we don't have that, we are. We should. We need to ask Allah to cultivate that in our hearts. Point number one, uh, in terms of an Islamic solution. Point number two is uh, there might not be one specific political course of action uh, for the political uh, difficulties that we have. Um, sometimes it there is very little we can do as individuals. Not nothing. As individuals but very little we could do and it actually requires the state or a, a muslim countries muslim states to act in the interest of islam and fellow muslims so we the political action the siyasa action needs to be done at the state level rather than the individual level so sometimes that is the case um the case of uh, uh of the palestinians Okay, we could boycott goods, and sometimes that has an effect, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it has has an effect one year, and it doesn't the other year. Likewise, um, uh, likewise, uh, raising awareness. Sometimes for years, okay, uh, uh, for years it has little effect. Neither the media side with uh, with our concerns and the general public are not really concerned and then all of a sudden the next you know years after uh the media could actually then be voicing the very concerns we've been voicing and we've seen that this year with palestine i mean for many years uh, the newspapers were i mean i'm not saying that the newspapers weren't skewered this time but actually there were some there were some articles in some well-known newspapers here in, in in the united states for example that uh, was quite unimaginable that they, you know, they would allow pieces to be written so in you know, not pro-Palestine, but at, at least saying something uh, definitive and actually making certain uh, criticisms uh, as well. Whereas a few years ago, it's, it was just stuck in a particular one-sided uh, rut. Um, so sometimes something works at one time it doesn't work at another time um such as with the palestinians or when when denmark decided to one when a danish uh, cartoon company decided to publish um, um some horrific pictures about the prophet and um they heeded the possible boycott but that's not a proof that boycotting works all the time Okay, but it is it is one of those ways of putting pressure on governments. If Muslim countries don't put pressure on governments, uh, we Islamically 
is there an obligation to say, well, Muslim countries aren't doing it, therefore I have no responsibility at all? Uh, generally, most scholars don't say that. Generally, most scholars say that um, if Muslim countries themselves don't work for the interest of Islam and the Muslims as they should do, though we don't, unfortunately, we don't, we don't expect them to, given the nature of many of those Muslim countries, uh, then we should individually uh, do what we can and um, do what we can, and, uh, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, won't take us to task. But if we don't do anything collectively, uh, we could be failing in a clear-cut fard or clear-cut obligation. So, secondly, being concerned with the affairs of the ummah and practically helping the situation is an overall fard al kifaya collective duty okay which oftentimes rests with muslim states and countries who have economies and armies armies and and bargaining power behind them but in the absence of that because of their being unfit for purpose um we might have individual obligations to do whatever little we can so that's the second point uh, the third point is uh, <laughs> we sometimes need to consider. So, you know, uh, ever since the mid 80s when I started practicing, and uh, there were political groups uh, doing dawah in the UK and, and worldwide, Muslim political groups, I found in my experience, so I, I can't say that this is a general rule, but in my experience, I found that a lot of the leaders of these organizations in the UK that I experienced were very poor in understanding either what the Quran or the Prophet said concerning political events that would happen and the root cause of Muslim weakness. Okay, and what was the what was the what is what is the solution or solutions that the Prophet said when you are going to be uh, in that weak state? I found that sometimes some of these leaders, so not workers and foot shops, foot soldiers, just actual leaders, uh, uh, shapers of of these uh, of these movements. I found that they didn't know some basic hadiths and whatever. And I also found that actually. It wasn't a place for hadith and Quran discussion. It was a place of emotional discussion. Uh, and I found that, subhanAllah, you know, it was really hard to get through to some people once the emotional button had been triggered. OK, um, and so here I am again uh, hesitating. And my smile is not because it's funny. It's because I'm going to say something. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that. Uh, that he helps me say it rightly and helps the uh, listeners to to hear it in the best possible way, and of course these these are my views. These are not the views of of yourself or or or, 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 or of the organisation. But the third point is, um, we need to somehow sometimes see, uh, be careful of not making the bl the blood and honour of certain Muslims greater than the blood and the honour of other Muslims. Um, the Prophet says, so either this is an authentic hadith going back to the Prophet according to some scholars, or these are the authentic words of Abdullah ibn Umar anhu, meaning these are his words and not the Prophet words. But I'll, I'll stick with the, it's the Prophet So these, these narrations can be found in the Sunan of Tirmidhi. That the Prophet is looking at the Kaaba. And he says words to the effect of, by Allah, how sacred you are to us or how sacred you are to me. But the sanctity of the believer is greater still. So he's looking at the Kaaba and saying you are a sacred. But the, the sanctity, the honor of the believer, of the Muslim is even greater in sacredness. Why? Because being very respectful for here because we're talking about the house of Allah and the, the, the Haram, the Haram Sharif. But when it, it boils down to it, it is bricks and mortar, right? The, the Kaaba itself is bricks and mortar. 
but the Muslim is living Iman, living Iman, living Tawheed, living Ibadah, right? And just like you and I would have absolute greatest respect of the Kaaba, uh, you know, uh, we would treat it with deference. We know it is sacred. We know it is one of the great symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that the place is the greatest place on earth. Just as we have that deference and respect uh, to magnify the sanctity of the Kaaba, then the honor of the Muslim is greater still. And I mentioned that in context of, I do find it sad that um, the amount of women and children that have died in Yemen, and I know Yemen is not to do with Israel, Yemen is not to do with non-Muslims, Yemen is to do with Muslims, you know, Saudi Arabia and it's whatever's left of its co coalition and its geopolitical plans and strategies. Okay, I, I, I understand that. But I'm just talking about the number of deaths in one year in Yemen, especially of women and children, and the famine and the lack of medication and no water. Um, and these figures are checkable. And I, and I would hold up my hands to say that, you know, um, I'm open to correction, but take the general lesson of what I'm saying and not the specific data. But more people have died in these few years in Yemen than, since, than all of the Palestinian Muslims since 1947 or, or, or 1967. If we're talking about numbers and sanctity, uh, but we, we seem to be quite quiet. I mean, there are some amazing charity organizations on the ground. Forgotten Women, for example, is one of them in Yemen. You know, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know the work that some Muslim organisations are doing is is absolutely just subhanallah. But generally, the rest of us, as a whole, we're pretty silent, right? So, are we now saying Masjid Al Aqsa because of its third greatest sanctity, it is sacred? So there's no denying that it is sacred. It's land. It's land. I mean, it's far. It extends into Jordan greater Syria, parts of Lebanon. It's all Mubarak, it's Baraka. Okay? It's not just that precinct there, it's larger than that, according to the Quranic description. But, it, but in the end, is that more sacred than the thousands and thousands of lives of Yemeni Muslims? And why is it that we, Alhamdulillah, Allah allowed us to, uh, what's the word? Not to, to, he, he allowed us to galvanize ourselves for that important cause of Palestine. Subhanallah. So, and again, let's leave non-Muslim uh, political activism out. Let's just keep it in-house. He allowed Muslims all over the world, right? And it was really amazing to see even the younger generation coming out, carrying on with, the, you know. And yet we, we seem to be very silent about the Uyghur Muslims in former Burma, Myanmar, Myanmar, um, or Yemeni Muslims, for example. But uh, um, uh, the Rohingya Muslims in sorry Myanmar and the uh, and the Uyghur Muslims in China, and I'm just wondering the the level of I mean we don't know much about China and the Uyghur Muslims. We've we've ha we've had a few things and few people spill the beans, but we still don't know. But let's just assume, given the numbers that possibly are there. Again, look at the numbers of being oppressed, but they're being oppressed, not with direct bonds, in subtler ways, which, and I don't mean this to be blasé, but there is a possibility, a, a strong possibility that if you have been bombed, it hasn't sh shaken your iman. You have possibly lost close family, maybe even children, countless relatives you, you have but in charlotte allah's you know generally kept your iman intact but from what we're hearing and the little we know about the uyghur muslims in china their iman is under threat that physically they okay they're not like underfed undernourished malnourished but their iman is under threat 
Um, and so it, it, it kind of, uh, I, I do get bewildered, and I don't know if it's my age or whatever, that, but what about, why haven't we galvanized ourselves for them or for them? And it's not that we haven't done anything, but we've done so little. But every time Palestinians, you know, I, there's a mosque, and I won't mention where or whoever, but there is a mosque in, in, in the UK, right? Uh, and I know that I, I and I know the, the players there, the president and things like that. And whenever Palestine comes up, it's a real big issue. And the mosque committee makes a big issue of it. But we don't hear any other issue of any other Muslims, except in a very, very quiet, timid way. And I find that disgraceful. I actually find that very un-Islamic. And that that can't be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants of us. What so all of a sudden these people in sacred space, uh Masjid al aqsa Jerusalem. I mean, of course, Pal Palestinians are over there uh, in in that strip called Gaza, and they're over there uh, in the West Bank, West Bank, because it's the west of Jordan. Um so they're not all in Jerusalem per se. Um, but they're in sacred space, let's just say. Uh, and all of a sudden that becomes important, but the number of lives other Muslims are, you know, uh, we're losing, there's nothing said. Now, of course, there is a principle here, uh, but I'm thinking, and I could be wrong, so this is just my thoughts, uh, Brother Abbas, and, you know, even you can kind of, you know, if I'm way off, then please let me know. The principle at stake with Palestine is not quite the same as the principle at stake with the Uyghur Muslims in China, but it still is a principle in we, with the Uyghur Muslims. And the principle at stake with the Rohingyas in former Burma, Myanmar, is in one sense more closer to the principle of the Palestinians, okay, homelessness and dispossessed people, uh, than it is with the Uyghurs. But I can't think of a, an oppressed people, except that they, they have their principle, they have their story. So why is it, why is the Israeli Zionist story of Palestine more worthy of my attention? If we're talking about numbers, numbers of Muslims who have died, then the, the Muslim story, the Muslim Uyghur story or the Muslim uh, Rohingya story and the principles behind that. When someone says to me, it's the principle, the, um, the Israelis came in and they brought up all the Zionists came in, they brought up all the land in 1967 and they took over the land and against international law and, 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 and settlements. And yeah, you know what? Absolutely. Um, uh, and righteous anger for the sake of Allah, the anger of the rule, not the nafs, the anger of the spirit, not the ego. It's well placed. If we, if we don't have anger at the injustice, just just stick with the injustice. Forget about the tyranny and the oppression. Okay, just the injustice of it. If we're not angry, then there's something wrong with our iman. And there's also something wrong with our sense of humanity as well. But why is that the bigger issue? And, and Yemen or, or Rohingya isn't. The Rohingyas aren't. That would be my that would be my question. And then I also think, so this is just personal feelings, you know, and I said, oh, I wouldn't try to get into emotions and feelings, but I just put a little bit, a bit of feeling in. I'm thinking that if I was oppressed and a few other Muslims were oppressed as well, you know, and we all had our own levels of oppression and just you and EF Dao organization just focused on the other Muslims and not me. I'd be really happy that, alhamdulillah, my Muslim brothers and sisters, you know, alhamdulillah, someone is helping them. But at some point I think, but don't I deserve a little bit? But where's, why doesn't Abbas say something about me? Why doesn't he have just a, one night talking about my oppression? And that seems to me what we're kind of doing. So we've all done Palestine and, and we've been reminded just because there's a ceasefire, it doesn't mean the oppression hasn't stopped, which is absolutely true. And what? The Uyghurs have all been released from their encampment. Uh, the Rohingyas have all been returned to their land. The, there, is, there isn't this Buddhist massacre of Muslims. Um, Saudi Arabia have what? Stopped the war and, you know, 
and women are, are, are now quite healthy with clean water and good vaccination with healthy kids. So, so this is where I, I feel that, you know what, where is the Islamic principle behind this? And how many times have I heard someone say, oh, so uh, what, you don't respect uh, Masjid al-Aqsa? Yeah, but what did the Prophet say? Or what did Ibn Umar say? You explain to me Ibn Umar's words in the, how they should fit in this context, because I have an explanation and I actually have a scholarly explanation. If you explain to me why my scholarly explanation based upon classical commentaries is wrong, I'm quite happy to change. You know, I'm not... I'm not committed to any specific view per se. I'm just trying to be a truth seek. So the third thing is, I can't see from an Islamic point of view that one issue, Palestine in this case, Palestinian Muslims, are more important or have a greater right than Rohingya or Uyghur for example, Muslims, and there are other Muslims that you mentioned as well. But let's just stick with, with, with those for the time being. What I do understand is that, um, you know, it is really a, just just an, the principle of how Palestinians became dispossessed. It's just such a story that just the, just the injustice of it all, and the injustice is made worse because many of these people or many of the the fathers and mothers of these people and grandparents, they experienced a Holocaust. And so they, they know better than many people, okay, the tyranny of the majority against, you know, against the minority. And yet, few generations later, well, starting from that time, it was that generation, up until now, it seems like that story has been forgotten. And so they're not, Palestinians aren't being gassed, but it's not the method of killing or of oppressing, it's the act of killing and oppressing. So it makes it doubly worse, it seems like. I, I, I get that. I really get that. And I got that from before I was a practicing Muslim. Okay, I was always born into a Muslim family, alhamdulillah. I, and I got that even, you know, even in the late 70s and 80s, when I went on my first, you know, a Palestinian, uh, 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 pro-Palestinian rally. But what I can't get as, uh, you know, from a Muslim perspective is why that must demand my attention more than something else. Rather, what it is, is since we can't go on every demonstration, <laughs> since we can't be working for every cause in a productive way, um, we're all going to have to specialise or focus. We need to just check ourselves, am I concerned for the affairs of the Muslims? If I'm not, that's a problem. If I am, but I could be doing more, then I must be doing, then I must do more. Okay, but it doesn't have to be specific. And we should not, our emotion should not be dictated by media or social media that when it's a big Palestinian thing, boom, there we are. With our anger, with our fists clenched, down in London, Trafalgar Square, or wherever it be, doing the business, marching, making people aware, sending texts, sending loads of videos to remind each other, spread the awareness, and every, everything else is silent. I... I it, unless someone can prove to me Palestinian blood and the Palestinian cause has a greater right than any other cause Islamically, until then, I don't see that to be right. I see that to be un-Islamic. Not that therefore I can't focus on Palestine. You can, if that's your focus. But it doesn't have to be everybody's focus. And you cannot, um, you cannot question my Islam or my commitment to, the, to this blessed Ummah just because I don't have that same level of commitment to Palestine, but I may have it elsewhere. That seems to me to be um, the third thing that we Muslims need to consider. The, the amount of people that are being killed outside of Palestine through a political tyranny, oppression, and kind of like semi-genocides uh, deserves 
our attention and they have a greater right over us that we speak about this and we raise the awareness as individuals. That's how it seems to me and Allah knows best I could be wrong. Um, then the fourth point is, though we can see some, see, so, uh, the scholars will tell us that we Muslims, the mu'min, the mu'min, he or she, the believer, he or she is a person of ma'ana, not surah. The person of ma'ana, not surah. A person of meaning, not form. So form is the outward. You're a lightly light colored Asian. I'm a slightly dark colored Asian. He's black. She's white. He's this. She's that. These are outward. This is the surah, the form. But the reality is to do with iman in the heart. So it's not whether you're black or white, male or female, east or west. It's piety, taqwa, godliness. That's the ma'ana. The reality the meaning okay so uh we you know we see we see the thunder we, we will hear the thunder it's really awesome that's the surah but the manner is that is the qudra of god that is the power of god manifesting itself so where we have the quran teaches the muslim to teaches the human being that yes consider the surah the form the outward of the thing but look beyond the outward look towards the meaning what is it what is it really about and what is it pointing to so the surah is the outward is that uh, the zionists wanted a homeland and then the british government at that time you know they decided for whatever reason they'll get their hands drenched in the blood of palestinians and fiddle you know, and betray and make false promises and whatever else our country did and gave the Zionists the, the doorway to to have their uh, national homeland in Palestine, even though initially the Zionist movement wanted to, were well, looking for some parts of Africa to, to establish their Zionist homeland. But anyway, uh, Britain having the Palestinian mandate, oh, it's for us to give. Arrogantly, it's for us to give. That's the that's the surah. And in the end, the Six Day War, where Egypt and Syria and all these, you know, Arab nationalism. It's, it's not Islam, Arab nationalism. And with the help of the American satellites and communication, a very small but very sophisticated Israeli army just wiped the floor in six days uh, with the greatest Middle Eastern Arab powers uh, in, in the Six Day War. And you know, it's in '67 or wherever. That's surah. That's form right and from there it was a matter of uh, the land of the palestinians just grew smaller and smaller that's sort of right what is the manna why does that happen why does god allow that to happen why does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow believers to be uh, subjugated or oppressed at the hand of non-believers muslims at the hand of non-muslims that is a question about the manna. How, what happened in uh, 1947, 1948, 1967, those are questions of surah, form, and they're important. And we have to, they have to be addressed somehow. But for Muslims, we have to also address the manna. Why did Allah allow this? And out of Allah's mercy, as you and I would probably expect, he allowed the Prophet to give us pretty good detail of why such things would happen. That whatever else we do in our political activism, we cannot ignore these advices of the Prophet. So I'm going to mention two hadith, though there are more, but these two seem to me to be highly relevant today. And that's what our scholars have been saying uh, throughout the 20th century, up until the 21st century. One of them, uh, I, I, they possibly are both in the Sunan of Abu Dawood. One is in the Sunan of Abu Dawood and one is in the Muslim of Ahmed, but they're all both authentic. So one of them goes uh, where the Prophet وسلم, says, uh, When you deal in Ina, 
particular form of transaction where you're trying to duck and dive the Sharia in order to uh, get the benefits of interest, but it's not clearly done. When you deal in Ina, a very subtle way of usury, of interest, riba, meaning you're finding way loopholes in the Sharia to do something haram. When you hold on to, uh, when you deal in Ina, you hold on to the tails of the cow of cows and you are satisfied with farming and you abandon jihad striving in the path of Allah Allah will permit your humiliation and he will not lift this humiliation from you hatta tarji'u ila dinikum until you return back to your religion not until you demonstrate not until you froth up their mouth in, in political anger, until you return back to your religion. When you start ducking and diving the rules and commands of, of Islam and holding on to the tails of the cow and, content, and, and being content with farming is just a way of saying it's an idiom. Okay, they say it's a kinaya. It's an idiom or, or a metaphorical expression of just being satisfied with a nine to five life, with a material life. When you deal in Ina, ducking and diving Sharia rules, and you hold on to the tails of the cow and be and satisfied with farming, meaning just materialistic, that's really what you're really living for mostly. And you abandon striving, striving whether with yourself, with your wealth, with your tongue, you know, with all the forms of jihad, okay? Uh, all the all the forms of jihad, the spiritual jihad, the financial jihad, uh, the military jihad, where and where it applies at the, from the state level onwards, then Allah will permit your humiliation. Because you have now shown yourself and the world you're living for material reasons and not for Allah and the hereafter. So now that you have defined yourself, this hadith is saying, with dunyaness, with worldliness, well, Allah will permit your humiliation and he will not lift this humiliation from you until you return back to your deen, your religion. It's the hadith in the Sunnah of Abu Dawud. In the Muslim of Ahmad, the Prophet prophesied, nations will soon summon each other to attack you, just like hungry diners swoop down upon a plate of food. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, sallallahu is that because that day we will be few in number? And he, sallallahu alayhi wa said, no, rather that day you will be plenty in number, but you will be like the white froth on the ocean waves. Okay. Uh, he described it as, ghutha ka ghutha is sail. The ghutha is just that frothy stuff on the waves. Okay. It has... Uh, it's useless it doesn't have any power in itself the wave moves this way it moves with it the wave moves that way it has it's 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 a, there's a lot of it there that a lot of that foamy stuff there but it's useless utterly and absolutely useless he starts and described the ummah that one day they will be like that and you'll be like the ghotha is sail. you'll be like the that frothy stuff on the ocean um which is really useless like like the uh, froth in the ocean and allah will take the fear out of the hearts of your enemy and cast into your hearts weakness and they said oh messenger of allah sallam, what is this wahan what is this weakness he said dunya wa mawt. love of this world and hatred for dying hatred for dying why because i'm too clinging to this world and also hatred for dying because because I've been too clingy to this world. I know that I've got no answers for Allah on the day of judgment. So that's another reason why I don't want to be dying yet. So the question we could ask ourselves and which we don't ask ourselves often enough as a collective in our political discussions is, are those two hadiths of the Prophet relevant to our situation today? Do they speak? To our, I'm not saying do they give a detailed 50-page document political answer, 
but do they speak to our situation today, our political situation today? And I believe, as most scholars, um, as the scholars believe, they do. And they speak to them actually in quite vivid terms. Well, why haven't we brought them into our political equations and our political thinking? Why is it that hardly any Muslim activists know these hadiths? What, how, how is this? How is it? How is it that this is not on the tongue or on the T-shirt of every Muslim political activist? And who am I to believe? Who am I to believe, uh, Abbas? Am I to believe my Prophet Sassim who says that this weakness is love of this world and hatred for dying uh, and um, uh, your humiliation is because you're ducking and diving the Sharia, uh, you're just contented with the dunya, you're abandoning the right forms of jihad, the, sh the Sharia prescribed forms of jihad. Um, am I to believe the Prophet Sassim's words as the as the reason behind our real political weakness, ma'ana, not surah, ma'ana, the actual reality behind it, not the form, the actual outward thing of how it happened. Or am I to believe whom? Who, who am I to believe as a Muslim? Do I think merely because I've read all the books, and I've read kind of books of, you know, what's happened in Palestine since, you know, the, the, the 1900s, since the, since the First World War, right? Um, it's subhanAllah. It's, uh, you know, how does that equip me to bring down the help of Allah? Or am I saying politically, if enough of us clench our fists, we can change the world? No. If you believe that you're, ste you're steeped in some level of shirk, shirk al asbab, I'm not saying that anyone's a, a, a kafir or a non Muslim, I'm just saying someone who believes that. Mm, Human might alone, Muslim might alone, can change, and it's not, and 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 ch you know that change can come independent of Allah's help. They're steeped in shirk al asbab. Okay, a person who's steeped in shirk al asbab, the shirk of using worldly causes, thinking your worldly causes have a real effect, as opposed to knowing that Allah is the causer of the causes in reality. And Allah is saying, well, if you do these things, you're not going to get my help. You're not, you're not going to get the help of the causer of causes. And and I know, I do know, and I do feel, so this again, this is a bit subjective in my, my own window of experience, that some people do use this as an excuse not to do anything. There are some people, may Allah guide us in them, uh, and I really mean that, who are just so loyalist to certain Muslim governments and then you think, well, you know what? That government has done such a tro atrocious thing. These brothers will woke up, wake up and they just become even more loyalists. They have more excuse right, for these shabby tyrants than they do for pious practicing Muslims. Because somehow they think that the orthodox Islam, that is not orthodox Islam. Orthodox Islam is not, uh, is not looking for rebellion and destabilization, even of tyrannical governments, okay, tyrannical Muslim governments. But it's also not saying, oh, yeah, Bismillah, just whatever they do, support them. In fact, one hadith says that you'll get rulers over you who will do things that are, are detestable. The one who hates it in his heart is excused from accounting. The one who uh, uh, feels bad about it is, uh, uh, is uh, excused from accounting. But the one who doesn't feel anything, it's like, oh, they did it. He is accountable. Why? Because the heart didn't even react to the wrong. Right. So I know I do know that there are some people, you know, groupings and cliques of people who seem to be using these hadiths that I quoted for. I hate this word, but it, I can't think of a better word, political quietism. We just don't do anything. And I'm not saying that political quietism means that, but I'm using it like that, not to do anything. And, and that's wrong because we have to do something. We have a, an obligation to do something but not run around like headless chickens and, you know, just use revolutionary ideas from this place and that place and somehow paint them green and think, Bob's your uncle, this is Islamic. Um, it, it, it didn't work. 
okay, from those times in the early 20th century. It didn't work throughout the 20th century. It won't work today. It won't work today, okay? So the fourth point is this. Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu has told us about the causes of our weakness, our, our social political weakness. Nations will soon summon each other to swoop down upon you for various reasons. Our lands, majority Muslim lands, full of oil, full of minerals, full of bits and pieces, or full of just Iman, and therefore we won't have to remove Iman from the world and the prophetic narratives from the narrative from the world so that we can have secularism and kufr and darkness and Dajjal and whatever. You know, whatever we're the uh, you know, whatever reason they're swooping down on, they will swoop down upon us. Will we be uh, small in number? Because that seemed to be a sensible thing. The only way people will get the better of the people of Iman and Tawheed is if there's thousands of them and there are only tens of us. And the process said, no, I, unfortunately, that isn't the case. If that was the case, that might be something. But actually, the case is that you, there'll be thousands of you. If there's thousands of them, there'll be thousands of you or even more or even more. And Allah will take the fear out of the hearts of your enemies. So at one, once upon a time, Allah cast the fear into their hearts. And that helped us right, in our political engagements, right? When the divine casts fear. But that's gone. And he will cast in our hearts what? Weakness. What is that weakness? Love of this world, hatred for death. Just So let's just focus on love of this world. Um, so how? So all I'm saying is, why can't we do the awareness and, and leaving the fiqh, issue, if fiqh difference of opinion about demonstrations and whatever okay and we so we do the demonstrations and we do whatever we're able to do making dua also that ya allah one day make majority muslim countries fit, fit for purpose and whatever and no good watching Ertugal and you know the beginning of the uh, the, the ottoman caliphate and really enjoying that and and what? <laughs> um, but at the, but at the same time, factor these. You know, let's have the conversation. So, how do do these have these fitting to our political activism and engagement? When the Prophet said, you know, ina hubu dunya materialism, how does that all fit in? And Allah will until you return back to your deen. He won't lift this humiliation from you. So even if the non-Muslims wanted to, even if the Zionists said, oh, for whatever reason, we would like to lift this humiliation from the Palestines. Let's just say, oh, we'll just do it for Gaza and not the West Bank. All right, very, very kind of you. Thank you, sir. But if Allah doesn't want it to happen, it won't happen. Why aren't we factoring any of this into our, you know, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Then there is another concern, Abbas, and I'm just going to stop it here. And this concern is not a proof that all political activism should stop. But it is something I, th I personally think can't be ignored. And I first noticed it in the late 70s uh, and early 80s when I went on some of these demonstrations. Uh, that these busloads would come. And it was also when we went on this demonstration. I, I saw it bigger because there was a bigger demonstration for the Barbary Mosque in India at that time. So, you know, Palestine, like the Muslim Asians, why should I bother? Because <laughs> it's not India, is it? Right? It's not Pakistan. But when it came to Barbary Mosque, woof, I mean, you know, Hyde Park was just like, you know, subhanAllah. Hyde Park was like, I don't know, like Karachi or something like that. <laughs> but just with... uh, and then it came time for prayer after the demonstrations and the speaker speeches and all the marching. We did all that. And it was all men all these coach loads from all over uh, the UK and out of like 20 bus loads worth. And we know that some of them would, would combine. So the Hor, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, we barely got on the Barbary thing. We barely got um, 80 people in a line when there must have been at least four or five or 6,000 men, grown men, all who have an obligation to pray. Okay, and same thing I noticed in Palestinian marches. And I used to think that's odd. I used to think that's odd. Um, and it, I'm, I'm wondering how much of that is similar today. So when a sheikh 
and I know this Sheikh, and he, and I know his commitment to the welfare of the Muslims, even politically. When he just and he's posted all these Palestinian things and all these Uyghur things, and then he just makes a side point that you know this is the amount of people in demonstrations. So he found a picture, and then this is Fajr in the Masjid. Okay, I mean there is COVID there and whatever, and it's not. It doesn't mean that people aren't praying Fajr at home, but it's kind of mm, Allah calls you for a gathering. And it's like, maybe if I have time, God. Do, do you see the point? And so when it's when our attitudes seem to be slightly off-centered from, from what the people of Iman should have, from what the mu'min should have, when the attitude is off-centered, how much barakah would be in our actions? Otherwise, we are firefighting. And I think we shouldn't be quibbling about the little that we are able to do, which is why I have a particular uh, religious view about demonstrations. But I, I think this is not the time to make an issue. And if people just want to demonstrate for whatever good or not it will do, we need to do something um, that hopefully has more benefit than harm. OK, uh, because uh, if not, the spark of Iman politically is going to die and die because we are in such an overwhelming situation. I mean, Palestine is just, it just in one sense, it can look so hopeless. Uyghurs, it can look so hopeless, right? How is any Muslim government, think about Muslim government, even the West, who now they borrowed all this money from China and China's financially backed them and doing all these economic mega projects. How are you going to, you know, not bite the hand that feeds you, but even criticize the hand that feeds you. I get it. I, I, I get it. Uh, and so it can look hopeless. So whatever little we do, but if we don't factor in these words of Allah and his messengers, Allah, if you help Allah, Allah will help you. Never does God change, and never does Allah change the condition of a people until they change what is within themselves. And so many other verses like that, and a few other hadiths are echoing the same sentiments. If we don't factor them into our political discourse and make them the, the root of it, why should we deserve the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we purposely have turned away from his guidance in this thing. It would be like saying, I'm going to go to Hajj, but I'm not going to follow the rules. I'm just going to do what I feel makes me happy. And hopefully God will bless it. Well, don't be surprised if God doesn't. Ramblings of a lunatic. Allah knows best. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Um, I think what I got from... What you said, Sheikh, in in, in a nutshell. <laughs> no, mashallah, in, in, in a nutshell. If and please correct me if I'm wrong, but we we tend to look for solutions outside of ourselves. We tend to analyze problems outside of ourselves, when in fact, really, the problems are within. And the correction needs to begin from within. And we sort of forget that component completely. Uh, and it's always this government is not doing this or these Muslims are not doing that or these bad people in China or in Israel are doing this to our brothers and sisters. But we, we don't sort of take a step back and think, what am I doing or not doing that is possibly contributing to becoming this foam that's just being thrown by the sea? And, so, and yeah. yeah. So, so can, I, can I just interject there? Um, yeah. Yes, you're absolutely spot on there. And I'm saying that part of the equation is the, is the ma'ana part, is the deeper underlying part that really forms the bedrock of our political activism but that doesn't mean take the case of palestine that i i shouldn't be thinking of you know what as a suggestion if we muslims in britain became economically more powerful and the wider society and government needed our uh economic uh power and our political voices 
then maybe maybe we would have even more of a uh, v not vetoing what's the thing when you a lobbying power, lobbying power. can you imagine yeah. How, can you imagine we are we are the richest communities in the uk muslims are I, heavily rich let's just say okay and you know uh, boris johnson can't really make a political decision without saying you know what well, i need to consult some of these trillionaire muslims and whatever and there's loads of them then at least these trillionaire muslims even if they're not saintly in themselves but generally even muslims like that they have this passion for islam and also they have a sense of their justice and injustice e despite what they've done in their business yeah then we can actually lobby government and say you know what Actually, we don't want you to keep siding with with the Yanks and being the wagging tail of yeah. of, of America's veto over you know you know in the UN for yeah. for Israel in favour of of the Zionists and whatever. So I'm saying that we need to think of those forms, the Sora. Yeah. But actually, it has to come with the mana, with the with the spiritual reality. Uh, in place. That's what I'm saying. I'm not yeah. saying one or the other. I'm saying both. But one is the essence of the other. Yeah. In, in some ways, uh, um, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's the foundation upon which you build a building, right? So those right. solutions that you're talking about, lobbying, uh, I mean, demonstrating, one of the things about demonstrating, uh, it, it, from my point of view, uh, is that even the brothers and sisters, the Uyghur brothers and uh, sisters, the Palestinians, the Kashmiris, when they see people thousands of miles away, collectively, it really gives them a lot of hope that we are not being ignored and our plight is in the hearts of our brothers and our sisters, our ummah. And, um, mashallah, you know, that really... If, if, if that... If that gives them that type of hope rather than assuages our own guilt for not doing much yes and that in itself will be enough to say demonstrate inshallah and i think so fundamentally uh sheikh i mean our, our near and our intention should be correct as well so when we go to demonstrate or we or we or we maybe make a youtube video or we do a stream it should be firstly obviously for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak out against an injustice and to support our brothers and sisters in, and try to change and to our capacity, whatever we can, rather than just use it, like you're saying, as a as a way of venting anger, my frustration, uh, you know, and just and, and releasing that almost as a uh, as a means of of, of um, doing some sort of a psychological, you know, betterment analysis or. Uh, appeasement of one's own frustration yeah, anyway. which is what i said it's, it's assuaging one's own guilt for yeah. doing wrong things or not doing the right things enough yeah so I, i've gone on this demonstration i feel i've done my I feel better now. You know, it's, it's okay you know i feel a bit better for missing my prayers yeah and i and i do understand the point that you're making that um you know as muslims we shouldn't prioritize um, certain brothers and sisters above others, and, and, and is is it fair to say that we we should also have concern when, for example, the Buddhists in China were, were going through difficulties with the Chinese regime, Sikhs were going through troubles in in India, for example, when the Golden Temple incident happened, or even recently we have the Indian farmers, many of whom are Sikhs who feel like they're being oppressed should should we be you know should we so, show concern about all injustice and be vocal about all injustice because i think sometimes sheikh what we do is that we tend to only be concerned about uh, an injustice when it's done to a muslim what, what would you say about that so let me ask you this question uh in the quran in the early Makkan chapters when the Quran says something about do not bury your female daughters alive, was it talking about Muslim female daughters or any female daughters? That's my question. Was it talking about Muslim female daughters or well, any it, female? It would be any, wouldn't it, really? It's an announcement as a proclamation to everyone. Okay. Stop doing this, basically. Right. Okay. So, excellent. 
when the Quran in the Meccan time says, don't, do not mistreat your slaves, was it about Muslim slaves, don't mistreat them, or don't mistreat any slaves? Yeah, it would, have been, it would have been the whole community, everybody, all. So there is a part of social economic justice, let's just call it justice, okay, that every human being falls under, regardless of their beliefs, their creed, their, their practices or lifestyle. Everybody has the right to justice, and it's forbidden for us to be unjust to anyone. The Makkan Suras are telling us, be concerned about the principle of justice, not necessarily who the justice or the injustice, you know, who are the players in the injustice and injustice. Be concerned with doing justice towards Muslims or towards non-Muslims, towards uh, believers or towards atheists. That's point one. Point two is, um, so that's the principle. So we should be concerned with justice for everyone. But the second of my three points is, uh, sometimes, it's uh, impractical because there are so many injustices of Muslims happening and our, our, and our resources uh, and numbers are limited, then we can only prioritize and focus on this. It's understandable why, why we focus on our own people of Iman. But in principle, it should be, if I had the ability, I would focus on uh, others well. And yeah. my third and final point is the Muslims in the UK, I can only speak about the UK Muslims, uh, and I could be wrong here, so this is just my outlook, and I could be wrong. Um, some of the Muslim organizations that claim themselves to be umbrella organizations for, for us Muslims, whether they do represent us or not, that's a different discussion. And even some of the well-known Dao groups and scholars in the UK, we need to not distort Islam uh, in the sense of, because we are so often silent about the injustices that are happening in the UK, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, police har harassment on on racial grounds, uh, whether it was you know whether it's you know the age old Stephen uh, you know, Lawrence and you know the black victimization and you know uh, our voice is silent. The Muslim voice of justice is silent. But once it's a Muslim thing. All of a sudden, yeah, uh, it's good to see that you're doing justice for uh, in terms of Palestine. But m myself, I'm not doing justice on anything outside of Islam. How mm. is that? Mm. Was the was the Prophet something like that? And does the and also does the Quran teach us to only do justice when it concerns Muslims, or is it justice to anybody and everybody? Um, so it would. It seems to me that we as a whole and our and our representative bodies and some of the main scholars and some of the main religious organizations in the UK, we need to at least genuinely voice our uh, our our agreement with these minorities have been persecuted or this particular act of injustice over here or whatever um, for the sake of the godly principle of justice. Not to score brownie points, even if we will get brownie points, inshallah, but for the principle, the godly principle itself. But it doesn't seem that we have done that. Individual Muslims have done that. There are individual Muslims who do that. OK, but on the whole, we haven't done that. So the answer to your question is it is justice for everybody. But I feel the UK Muslims, we have we are failing uh, being people of justice all round. And we're only doing it in house, and and that's how a lot of Mus non that's how a lot of non-Muslims that I've met perceive us. That if it's Palestine, we're going to get voices and whatever. In fact, they they some of them have said to me, "Do you only do justice for Arab Muslims?" Mm. And I think you know what it is, Sheikh. Also, like for example, I remember when there were uh, I don't if you remember there was a play that was done. Uh, about Jesus, I think it was Jerry Springer. Um, he, you know, he did a very. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, and 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 it was about Jesus. Peace be upon him. Now we we re recognize and revere and love and respect Jesus. Peace be upon him. 
And yet, um, and and and, I'm, and I don't want to sound hypocritical here but, because but it, didn't, it didn't merit. It didn't merit our our anger, outrage, our, yeah. our outrage, yeah. our yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and, um, and and I think perhaps that's where we, when, when we perhaps are silent um, about other issues um, that are equally important or are, or are certainly very important, um, we should I think be more active in those. In those things so on those demonstrations for example w w with our christian brothers and sisters we should also have placards saying that this is uh this is obscene and that this is uh uh you know completely outside of uh what would deem as as reasonable speech or even or even free speech you know it's it's ridicule and we shouldn't stand up for it and may line shall i inspire all of us myself uh first um, to, to, to um, acknowledge so that Mashallah, the, the, the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu what we hear when a, a Jew and a, and a Muslim comes uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu with a dispute and he ends up siding with the Jew uh, because the Jew was was in that matter, the Prophet Sallallahu perceived that to be correct and right. And so that was, Mashallah, a great example for us. Uh, that event was a great example for us that we should be standing up for justice and fairness, uh, even Indeed. if it's... Uh, as the Quran says, against ourselves or against our parents or against our kin, whether one is rich or poor, um, may Allah also, inshallah, inspire us to, uh, uh, as you said, you know, be true activists and stand up against injustice, uh, but also the injustices that we ourselves do. Uh, when, like you said, a Sheikh, that you know, we we. we um, we like to do these sunnas and we like to do these practices that are, you know, we call them the sweet sunnas. The, the, the ones that are sort of easy to do or the ones that we enjoy to do. And the ones that the, the, often the farah, the, the compulsory acts, like reading your fajr salah, your prayer first thing in the morning. You know, we, we, we some of us won't read the fajr salah because it's too early. It's, oh, it's summertime now. It's like I've got to get up at you know, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning to do that. But then later that morning, I'll be on a demonstration. <laughs> and I think this is the sort of things that perhaps we need to uh, we need to look at. But I think, Sheikh, also at the same token, we need to, mashallah, we, I think we do need to feel positive as well that, mashallah, there is this concern that tens of thousands of people, Muslims and non-Muslims, have got out of their comfortable houses uh, and and you know they're and they've gone and they've demonstrated and they walk for miles in solidarity. They've spoken out. Mashallah, I know some of the brothers on the Dawa circuit as well have done a lot of work. Jordan brother Jordan's done a lot of work with the Uyghur, uh, Mashallah, awesome. Muslims uh, brother. So his channel, uh, he's done a lot of work for the Uyghur Muslims as well. Yemen, mashallah, brother Jordan has raised a lot of my uh, brothers and sisters in Yemen on his channel, uh, many, many thousands of, of, of pounds. So I actually, you know, I know you probably won't like me saying this, but I find many of our new Muslim brothers and sisters like Jordan, for example, very inspirational because they're so active. Absolutely. Uh, mashallah. Converts, you know, converts are often very, very inspirational. Mashallah. They often, get to, they often get to the essence of Islam before us kind of born into Muslim, born into Muslim families, get it. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. the candy sometimes. There are too many examples of that not to be, for it not to be true. Yeah, mashallah. Um, so, That's you know, man, a brown white complex. That's just how it is. Yeah, no, alhamdulillah. No, absolutely. I, I totally, totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, there's this uh, love and concern and uh, for, for what's happening to the ummah. And it's not just getting angry, getting upset, getting frustrated. But it's like, what can I do? You know, so they're outside the Chinese embassy and they're just, uh, you know, they're just having their voices heard. And it's not about whether that's going to change anything or it's going to have a significant impact. But that's all I can do. So that's what I will do. Yeah. That's the limit to what I can do. So I'm yeah. going to try to go to the limit of my own abilities, which is much like very inspiring. So I think... At the same token, I'd like to finish it on a positive note as well, that, yes, we are fragmented. Yes, there are problems. Uh, yes, sometimes we forget the very foundational importance of, of purifying ourselves and connecting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then there is 
there is still this concern and there is not apathy, complete apathy. We're not completely asleep. And that is a blessing from God. And there is, that is a blessing, mashallah. And I think that is something very positive for our brothers and sisters. I know that some of the Uyghur brothers and sisters have also commented that when you in the West are outside the embassy or you're protesting, it gives us a great feeling of of ummah of of value of and you know it strengthens our iman it strengthens their belief that this is one ummah mashallah subhanallah allah bless you for that alhamdulillah allah, and allah bless you know uh, uh all of the muslims all of us uh, and to, but you're right you know i i'm very hopeful i i see in the younger generation even though sometimes initially they may get caught caught up in woke ideologies and whatever but they're trying to connect their activism uh, with um, a scholarly understanding of Islam so that they can do the right things and you know their actions be blessed by God. I see that happening more and more. I think we're on the cusp of that beginning to be the norm. It might take 10, 20, 30 years more. So it, I, I'm very hopeful in, in that a lot, alhamdulillah. And also many of the young Muslims, uh, they feel much more connected globally they're, they're not kind of localized to a, a particular nationalism in the way that maybe um some of the uh, some of us elders were so there's a lot of positivity um and as you said uh, for them going out there uh just for that concern alhamdulillah uh my my hope is that um that we wouldn't limit it to just um short-term uh re knee-jerk reactions Okay, I don't want to undermine the uh, demonstrations, but they are they are knee jerk. We, they are response to something, um, but that doesn't undermine their value. Uh, we should also be thinking of, of long term political um, action, uh, inde independent of of state authority. I mean, independent of mu Muslim state authority, because we don't know when Muslim states are going to get their act together or not. So we can't just wait for them. And we also need to then focus at the same time on ma'ana, return, you know, humiliation lifted, hatta when you return back to your religion. Weakness, what is that weakness? Hubbu dunya wa karahit al And we've uh, love of this world and hatred for death, factoring those things into our, uh, our political outlooks and engagement. And there will be, subhanAllah, uh, there will be great blessings, inshallah, Sala. That is that is the hope and that is the dua, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. And Sheikh, I think the other thing for me is that as difficult as it is to watch the suffering around the world, for both Muslims and, and non-Muslim, we also have to appreciate that, you know, though these though these things can really affect us and we can really feel that it's a catastrophe almost, you know, like a, a complete catastrophe, we have to keep things into perspective as well as difficult as they are because we're told that on the day of judgment you know when the matter is settled and the the, the the person who has seen no good and no comfort and no let's say no blessings in terms of you know uh, ease in this world when he's dipped in jannah in paradise but for but a blink of an eye and he's taken out and questioned did you see any suffering and he says, Wallah, I swear by my Lord that I saw no suffering, subhanAllah. And similarly, the one who has had all the pleasures and the comforts of this life, and he is but dipped into Jahannam, the hellfire, for a split second and taken out and questioned, did you see any good? And he says that, I swear by my Lord, I saw no good. And so we need to, as Muslims, inshallah, be strong as well. And we need to realize that as difficult as these things are, and we are concerned and we want to, inshallah, better ourselves and inshallah, try to better the, the conditions of our brothers and sisters, that this is but a blink of an eye. This world is but a blink of an eye. And have, have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he sees everything. He hears everything and every wrong will be made right. SubhanAllah. And that inshallah, we have another place to go. And we, we pray and we wish and we uh, beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that that place is with our Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, and that Amen. is Jannah and the pleasure of Allah and the company of Allah and the closeness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So we Amen. mustn't lose that the positivity Same. because Islam is mashallah positivity. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah fikum Abbas, absolutely spot on, mashallah. Allah bless you. So I think with that, Shaykh, uh, Alhamdulillah, just khair for another beautiful episode. Barakallah fikum, Allah bless you. Could I just give my salams back to all of the uh, uh, all of the people who kind of signed in at the uh, at the beginning, giving their salams. Uh, wa alaikum salam, alhamdulillah. Nice to see some names that I hadn't seen since. Uh, you know, Ramadan uh, started. Uh, Allah bless you all, inshallah ta'ala, and all of the uh, other people that have, have joined. And uh, and our and our dua is that uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he protects the ummah, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, looks after the ummah, he lifts this humiliation uh, from us, that he returns us back to practicing our religion in the way that he is pleased with us that he doesn't allow that he gives triumph to tawheed and iman and not in a not in an egotistical way and not oh give triumph to me but triumph to the glory of god Amen. and the tawheed of allah and iman in allah and we also know the Quran says, "Wa aqibatu lil muttaqin," and the end is for uh, the the muttaqin, the godly people, the people of piety. Um, so there's a lot to hope for. There's just a lot of work to do, and a lot of patience to be had. Patience is not complacency. Patience is persevering, persevering in doing the right thing, or the wisest thing in that given situation. Patience is a re religious requirement. Complacency is an anti-virtue, something that we can't be about. But let's not confuse sabr, uh, patience with complacency. So when the Quran says isbir or have sabr, it doesn't mean don't do anything. When our ulama, when our scholars remind us isbir, have patience, don't think they're saying, oh, don't do anything. They're saying, do the things that you can according to what Allah tells you that he wants from you. And you will see the divine hand start interfering in your social political life to make things better. Because it is the divine hand alone that has control over all things. Alhamdulillah. But we need to do a little bit to, to get Allah to do a lot for us. Inshallah. Inshallah so with that brothers and sisters please remember us and our families uh, and the whole of the ummah in your prayers and your dua uh, one of the things Shaykh that I learned was that one of the best duas that you can make is that afia Allah wish you wish afia that Allah blesses the, the ummah, is uh, families with afia and afia Amen. is a beautiful dua because it means every difficulty is removed and uh, it's uh, a complete uh, essence in terms of ease from whether it's health or financial or spiritual or whatever ailments we could have so Amen. pray for afia inshallah for us and our families and for the ummah with that uh sheikh jazakallah khair to you Allah bless you it's nice to be back on the show in, the, in conversation lovely lovely, lovely to have you as always mashallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa